alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Peace, blessings, and mercy be upon you and your loved ones. Again, welcome to another edition of Dua wa Da'wa. Dua, supplication, and Da'wa invitation. Today, we'd like to visit another beautiful Dua from uh, a daily ibadah we do every day from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We usually say it after wudu and has ample many many rewards. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, reported that the Prophet said, Ma min ahadin minkum wudu إلا فتحت له أبواب الجنة الثمانية يدخل من أيها شاء رواه مسلم. In this hadith reported by Imam Muslim, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, if any one of you makes wudu and does it properly, and at the end of the wudu says, I bear witness the shahada, أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله. I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله. And I bear witness that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is his servant and messenger. Allah opens for him or her the eight gates of Jannah. He will, insha Allah, or she will, in the day of judgment, have the chance to choose which gate he or she would want to enter. This is amazing reward for the person who makes wudu and makes this alhamdulillah sunnah imam tirmidhi added and adds allahumma ja'alni min at-tawwabin wa ja'alni min al-mutatahirin o allah make me from those who constantly repent to you they make mistakes they ask forgiveness and make tawbah constantly not only ta'ibin the ones who are making tawbah tawabin they are sirat al meaning they make tawbah constantly and consistently they are asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept their tawbah what is tawbah is repentance to have this strong determination not to go back to do the same sin and also to feel regret for the sin you've done and to refrain from doing that sin. There are six conditions of tawbah, probably we'll discuss another time. But to be tawab is, and also mutatahirin, the people, not tahirin only, the people who clean themselves, mutatahirin, meaning it's a continuous thing, at-tatahur, ayil hirs ala tahara. Always your adamant and consistently making sure you are in Tahara, like Sayyidina Bilal, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, who um, Nabi Sassim gave, uh, he, uh, whom uh, Nabi Sassim gave him good uh, glad tidings that he heard his footsteps in Jannah and asked him what is special that you do. He said, I always keep myself in wudu. Even when I lose wudu, immediately I make wudu. I never keep myself in a state where I'm not in wudu. And that's why he heard his footsteps in Jannah. So, Tatahur is more than tathir. You are always ask, uh, making yourself in a state of cleanliness. You're in a high standards of cleanliness. So, in the Quran, Allah says after he stated the ayat from chapter 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, he says, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabina wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. Allah loves those who seek Allah's forgiveness and repent to him and also are adamant and consistent in cleaning themselves and always seek cleanliness because at-tahuru shatru al-iman cleanliness is half of iman so my brothers and sisters this dua we repeat it after you finish your wudu and you do it inshallah nicely you actually you say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Allahumma ja'anni min al-tawabina wa ja'anni min al-mutatahirin. It's an invitation to Jannah. Jannah has eight gates. 
Jahannam has seven gates. I always say, inshallah, inshallah, many will enter Jannah because Jannah has more gates than Jahannam. Jahannam laha sab'atu abwab li kulli babin juz'un maqsum. Every, uh, you know, uh, the Jahannam has seven gates. Jannah has eight gates. This is an indication that there is mercy. We have Babu Rayyan. You know, Bab Rahma, Bab Ramadan, you know, and 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 the and special gates for you know different people. But you, as a person who is seeking Allah's forgiveness and making tawbah, and you are a person who cleans himself or herself, this is why Allah will give you the choice to enter from wherever you want. And this is my brothers and sisters an invitation to tawbah. And Allah SWT loves those who make tawbah. What is tawbah, as I said, is you feel regret. You've done something wrong and you stop. And, and Nabi SAW, in spite of his status, he used to make tawbah uh, every day. He said, Wallahi inni la astaghfirullah wa atubu lehi fil yawmi akthara min sab'ina marra. By Allah, by Allah, he swears by Allah, I ask Allah's forgiveness and I repent to him every single day more than 70 times. And Arabs, when they use 70, it's like not seven zero, it's more than that. In another uh, narration, مِعَتَمَرَّ, 100 times. This is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how about me and you? If we ask Allah forgiveness, he will forgive us and we make tawbah. Tawbah already has for uh, istighfar because you ask Allah forgiveness and you say, Ya Allah, I will not go back. Ya Allah, I regret doing this. Do it. Some people say, you are well, I am not sure. Do not go to sleep without tawbah. That's why one of the duas we will see later is to ask Allah to forgive you and you repent to him when you go to sleep. Allahumma inni aslamtu wa nafsi ilayk wa jahtu uji ilayk wa fawwata umri ilayk wa alja'atu dhahri ilayk raghbatan wa rahbatan ilayk la malja'u la min jaminka ilayk amantu bi kitabika ladhi anzaltu bi nabiyika ladhi arsalt and you make these duas because that's it. You never know if you're going to wake up again. So tawbah, my brothers and sisters, we say it after salat. Astaghfirullah al-Azim al-Ladhi la ilaha illa wa al-Hayyu qayyum wa atubu lahi. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you say this dua and dhikr, غُفِرَتْ لَهُ ذُنُوبُهُ وَلَوْ كَانَتْ مِتْلَ زَبَدِ الْبَحْرِ Your sins will be forgiven if it's as much as the, you know, the, 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 the scum of the waves in, in the ocean, you know, the, the, the water that the, the, when it hits the, 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 the shore, it foams, that foam as much as the foam of the oceans of the world, subhanAllah. So Allah will forgive us. We should make tawbah all the time. Allah loves. You know, in the Quran, there are only a few verses where Allah says, Inna Allah yuhibbu kada, inna Allah yuhib. And one of them is, Inna Allah yuhibbu al-tawabina wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. Fallahumma ja'anna min al-tawabin wa ja'anna min al-mutatahirin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Hiyakum Allah, akhwani wa akhwati wa ahlum wa marhaban bikum. Halaqa jadida min... حلقات تصحيح المفاهيم عبر تطبيق مسلم دو أبليكيشن والذي يأتيكم بثا مباشرا من شرق كندا هذا محدثكم ومحب الخير لكم أمجد قرشا يحييكم فأهلا مرحبا بكم مع تصحيح المفاهيم وننبه للراغبين أو للمهتمين أن هذه الحلقة بعد حوالي ساعة ونصف من الآن سيتم إعادتها أداء مباشرا باللغة الإنجليزية المفاهيم التي ستسمعون الآن سيعاد طرحها باللغة الإنجليزية فمسلم دو أبليكيشن يبث من كندا بشكل أساسي للمسلمين في شمال أمريكا وحوالي 70% من برامجنا باللغة الإنجليزية و30% منها باللغة العربية لمن يعرف اللغة العربية من الجاليات الموجودة حياكم الله أهلا مرحبا بكم حلقة اليوم في تصحيح المفاهيم عن مفهوم الأمر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر هذا الموضوع يا أخوة طبعا ممكن الواحد ألفت فيه كتب ومجلدات وربما لو أردنا إعطائه حقه لاحتاج منا ساعات وساعات لكن تقريبا بالربع ساعة المتاحة لنا أريد أن أنبه كما كما هي العادة هذا البرنامج هو عنوانه تصحيح مفاهيم في اختلاط ببعض المفاهيم بعض الأحيان قيم معينة مدركات معينة نقاط معينة تتداخل 
تفهم خطا تفهم مقلوبه تفهم عكسيه فتسبب في اشكاليات في السلوكات مفهوم الامر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر تعامل بعض المسلمين معه بتطرف على الجهتين اقصى اليمين واقصى اليسار فبعضهم اخذ المفهوم بحرفيه مطلقه دون تدرج ودون تفصيل ودون تمييز ودون تصنيف ودون تدرج فاستخدموا الغلظه والشده واليد بالمعنى الحرفي فشتموا او اذوا او ضربوا او اعتدوا وهذا خاطئ لا يجوز في المقابل عندنا من ابتعد عن المفهوم تماما 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 واستخدم قواعد لا علاقة لها بالإسلام من مثل حرية شخصية دع الخلق للخالق حط راسك بين الروس قول يا قطاع الروس بدك تقيم الدين في مالطا وأنا إيش خاصني إلى آخر المفاهيم هذا المفهوم بعيد جدا عن حقيقة الأمر بالمعروف عن المنكر وهذا المفهوم أيضا بعيد جدا سنحاول فهم مفهوم الأمر بالمعروف عن المنكر عبر بضع نصوص مشهورة ومعروفة جدا نبسط معناها نلملم شعث سوء الفهم حولها ونضعه إن شاء الله على بساط مبسط سهل ميسر يفهمه الصغير والكبير بإذن المولى عز وجل طبعا التذكير الأول قبل أن نبتدأ بالنصوص تذكروا أننا أمة نص وأمة وحي وشرعنا قائم بالدرجة الأولى على كتاب ربنا وسنة نبينا الصحيحة المتواترة والصحيحة فبالتالي نحن نتعامل في علاقتنا مع ربنا فيما ينبغي أن نفعل ولا نفعل على نصوص تلقتها الأمة عبر وسائل من الغربلة أرقى شيء ممكن أن يتخيله العقل البشري فعندنا نصوص وحي أعلمنا الله بها ماذا نفعل كيف نفعل لماذا نفعل إلى آخر هذه المعاني فليس عندنا اجتهاد فقط بالأحاسيس والمشاعر الشخصية لأنه لو تركت الأمر للاجتهاد الشخصي ولم يكن هناك نقطة مرجعية لتعددت الآراء والأهواء والشهوات في كل قضية بعدد الأمة فقد يأتيك مليون رأي إذا كان البلد فيها مليون شخص ولن تصل إلى نتيجة وهذه من عظمة وروعة ديننا أن الله سبحانه وتعالى أكرمنا بنص وبوحي وهذا الوحي فيه نوعان من النصوص نص يسمى أو نص تسمى قطعية الدلالة أي المعنى المقصود من الكلام واضح لا يحتمل أي شبهة ولا أي معنى آخر إلا معنى واحدا وهناك نصوص تسمى بلغة الفقه وأصول الفقه ولغة الشرع ظنية الدلالة أي الله أنزالها والنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قالها هي نفسها تحتمل أن أكثر من معنى بهدف المرونة والتوسعة على الأمة طيب الآن النقطة التي تليها سأحاول تغطية هذا الموضوع عبر النصوص التالية قول الله تعالى كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر والنص الذي يليه الحديث الشهير من رأى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيده فإن لم يستطع فبلسانه وإن لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك أضعف الإيمان وعبر ما نسميه بحديث السفينة حيث قال فيه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مثل القائم على حدود الله والواقع فيها كمثل قوم ركبوا سفينة نشرحه في وقته ثم نختم بالظلال العام لآيتين كريمتين لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها وأيضا لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا ما آتاها في ظلال هذه النصوص الخمسة سنحاول حل حالة الإشكاليات بإذن الله طبعا حول مفهوم الأمر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر الرسالة الأولى بالنص الأول بالتصحيح الأول الله سبحانه وتعالى في سياق خطابه لأمة الإسلام ولأمة المسلمين قال كنتم خير أفضل خير أمة أخرجت للناس أنت رقم واحد يا مسلمين بما جاءت الجملة التي بعدها لتبين سبب الخيرية بسبب رئيسي لأنكم تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر يعني المنكرات ماشي؟ الشرور الفواحش أنتم مصممون دائما بتغييرها وإزالتها والخير 
والبر والحق والعدل أنتم دائما تنشرونه وتقومون بتثبيته والأمر به ما يميزك ويجعل فيك الخيرية أيها المسلم أنك تأمر بالمعروف وتنهى عن المنكر فإن اختفى منك كأمة أو كمجموعة أو كشخص مفهوم الأمر المعروف النهي عن المنكر زالت عنك الخيرية بالمنطق البداهي للنص القرآني كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس ليش؟ تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر هذا الرسالة الأولى في المفاهيم بمعنى نحن لا نتحدث عن مفهوم فلسفي غنوصي غيبي مطلق طارب مغمم لا 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 النص النص واضح كنتم خير امه تامرون تنهون نقطه طيب الان الحديث الذي بعده بعده الذي يساعدنا النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو ربما اكثر حديث فهمه بعض المسلمين بطريقه خاطئه والمشكله في الفهم وليس في النص لان بعض الناس للاسف لا يرجعون الى اهل العلم ولا يرجعون الى كتب العلم ولا يرجعون إلى حلقات العلم ولا يرجعون إلى أهل العلم الحقيقي علوم الإسلامية ليست علوم سطحية بسيطة هيك يعني مش بسموها الكراش كورسز مش زي طبعاً بدون, بدون تعميم طبعاً زي بعض أمور التنمية البشرية بيعطيك دورة من 12 ساعة بثلاث أيام تصير مدرب طبعاً كيف بعرفش يعني بتسمع عن ده كذا الأخير كيف تصبح مدرباً في ست ساعات مدرب ست ساعات اشتغلنا ثلاثين سنة حتى ها يعني وعلى خجل نحكي كلمة مدرب 30 سنة بقول لك 6 ساعات أو 12 ساعة أو 30 ساعة حتى بأسبوع بطلعك مدرب لا 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 هذا مش بالإسلام لا 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 لك تجلس على الركب لك تجلس على الركب الصحابة صح بعضهم صاحب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مثل أبو بكر أبو بكر يكاد لا يفارق ظل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أبو بكر رضي الله عنه سنين أخذ الشهد التنزل والوحي والمفاهيم والنقاش والحوار ولما كان يسأل سؤال هو أو عمر الخطاب يرتعش أحدهما ويرتجف قبل ما يجاوب لأنه يخشى أن يجيب إجابة خاطئة لا تحقق مراد الله من النص وبعض إخوتنا الله يسامحهم والأخوات بيقول لك أنا أعتقد أنا أظن أنا أشعر أنا هيك شايف والنصوص أمامه بتقول إشي ثاني آخر لا من دير بالنا من رأى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيده فإن لم يستطع فبلسانه فإن لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك أضعف الإمام بدنا ننتبه هنا هذا الحديث يتحدث عن القيمة الرتبية للأمر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر عفوا يتحدث عن القيمة الرتبية لتغيير المنكر قال من رأى منكم منكرا فليغيره بيده فإن لم يستطع فبلسانه طب واحد بيجي بسأل بيقول طب يا أخي إذا قدرت أغيره بلساني ليش أروح بيدي آه لأنه الفهم أصلا خاطئ الحديث لا يطلب منك أنا هذا بسموه الترتيب الرتبي يعني رتبة التغيير باليد بمعنى القوة والسلطة قيمتها الأعلى عند الله لأنها الأكثر صعوبة والأكثر مؤونة فرتبة التغيير بالقوة أعلى من رتبة التغيير باللسان واللسان أعلى بالتغيير من موضوع القلب هو إنكار بالقلب وأنت على السكت لأنه مش طالع بإيدك شيء هذا الترتيب سموه ترتيب رتبة أو ترتيب رتبي لأنه أنت إذا استطعت تغير بلسانك ما في داعي تستخدم السلطة خلاص رد عليك وانتهى المنكر ليش أستخدم القوة هذا من زاوية اثنين كثير من الناس فهموا أن التغيير باليد بالمعنى الحرفي أمامك منكر روح بإيدك طا طا لا 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 من هذا هل راحوا العلماء وفسروه اليد هنا تعبر عن يعني فليغيره بيده وتعني بالمجمل معنى السلطة والقوة فإن كنت صاحب قوة صاحب سلطة يعني باللغة المبسطة تبعتنا الآن من كان رئيسا زعيما رئيس وزراء وزير قائد شرطة مدير أمن مخابرات منصب حكومة هذول كلهم شو بنسميهم الآن أصحاب سلطة أصحاب قوة يملك قوة وسلطة إذا أمر يتوقف الأمر إذا اتصل تأتي الأجهزة المختصة لتغيير الواقع لتثبيت الوهاي كلها تقع تحت معنى السلطة القوة اليد بمعنى الشرع بيقول 
إذا ربنا حطك في مكان سلطة ورأيت منكرا ما بينفع تروح تحكي أبي أمرك أنت صاحب سلطة الآن باليد طب النقطة اللي بعدها فإن لم يستطع لأنك أنت مش صاحب سلطة زي أنا هلا بحكي معكم أنا أنا لست صاحب سلطة يعني لا أنا وزير ولا أنا حاكم ولا أنا رئيس وزراء ولا أنا ما فيش عندي سلطة فبالتالي بنتقل للمرحلة الثانية شو هي؟ بلسانه اللي هو التذكير الوعظ الشرح النقاش الحوار الجدل المناظرة بيان الكذب النفاق الخطأ الصح التوضيح الشرح الإقناع التذكير الموعظة كلها تدخل تحت موضوع تغيير اللسان اللي هو يقوم به تقريبا كل داعية على كوكب الأرض من ضمن تغيير المنكر بلسانه من باب التوضيح ويدخل فيه فلولا نفر من كل فرقة طائفة يتفقه في الدين ولينذروا قومهم إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحذرون هذا من تغيير المنكر بيوضح لهم ديروا بالكم هذا السلوك خطأ هذا المفهوم خطأ هذا يخرج من الملة هذا يؤثر هذا كذا هذا هذا إلى آخره قال فإن لم يستطع فبلسانه عفوا فإن لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك أضعف الإمام حتى لسانه قد يحاسب عليه ويسجن ويحبس ويعذب ومش قادر يعني في سلطة غاشمة حاكمة وهذا موجود في الدول العربية للأسف عندها على الأقل دير بالك اصحك إذا قلبك حتى مش حاسس في الموضوع كارثة يعني أنت مش قادر تغير لا أنت عندك سلطة ولا عندك كذا فلكن بعدها دير بالك يعني على الأقل من ضايق من زعج قلبك يتمنى أن يتغير المنكر إذا مش بين قوسين مش فارقة معك لا. لأن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في رواية قال وذلك أضعف الإيمان هذا حد الأدنى من في رواية أخرى وليس بعد ذلك مثقال حبة خردل من إيمان كانوا بقول لك إذا حتى قلبك ما انزعج وتمنى التغيير يعني كأنك أنت طلعت برا دائرة الإيمان يعني موضوع خطير فالآن فالحديث اذا الايه الاولى تبين الخيريه من خلال وظيفه امر معروف نهي عن المنكر الخيريه اثنين لما تحدث عن المنكر قال لك اعلى رتبه فيها اجر وثواب وصعوبه هي اليد بمعنى السلطه والقوه لكن اذا قدرت تغير باللسان غير بس هذاك رتبته اعلى لكن انت وقدرتك على الموضوع النقطه اللي بعديها انه بدنا ننتبه انه اليد لا تعني انه انت تشوف خطا مباشره صاحب سلطه مش سلطه انت لا انت قاضي لا انت شرطي لا انت حاكم لا انت نائب لا انت وزير لا تملك تروح لا خطا لا يجوز ديروا بالكم تملك هنا ايش فقط التذكير او الاتصال او التبليغ مش لو كل واحد بده يروح يعمل الموضوع بنفسه بالطريقه هاي لحصل الكوارث على ارض المستقبل قد قد تاتي طبعا هذا فيه تفصيل لكن انا بالعموم بدي اقول الان الحديث اللي بعده اللي بدنا نفهم واحنا عم نصحح الامر معروف نهي عن المنكر في الدقائق الثلاثه او الاربعه المتبقيه اللي هو حديث السفينه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال من راى مثل القائم على حدود الله والواقع فيها كمثل قوم ركبوا سفينه فاستهموا فكان قوم في اعلاها وقوم في اسفلها جماعه ركبوا سفينه عددهم كان كبير بعضهم بالطابق العلوي بعضهم بالطابق السفلي قال فكان الذين في الط... في الذين في اسفلها اذا ارادوا ماء من البحر خرجوا فازعجوا اخوتهم قال فقالوا تخيلوا المجموعه اللي جوا السفينه اذا احتاجوا مي لاي غرض من اغراض من ميه البحر يطلعوا على السلم على الطابق الفوقاني فيزعجون اخوتهم فبحسن نيه وطيب شو قالوا قالوا هلا حفرنا حفرة أو نقبنا نقبا في حصتنا يعني إحنا بالطابق الأرضي تبع السفينة اللي هو ملامس لسطح المي طبعا قال بدل ما نطلع على السلم ونزعج اللي فوق خلينا نحفر حفرة صغيرة ونأخد منها المي شوف أنت يعني النية كانت طيبة العمل لو انعمل في كارثة بتصير النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بيقمل بيتحدث الآن بالضمير عن القوم الذين في أعلاها قال فإن هم اللي في أعلاها تركوهم اللي في أسفلها وما أرادوا هلكوا وهلكوا راحوا غرقة السفينة افتح حفرة تحت الكل راح يغرق مش بس اللي تحت فقال وإنهم أمسكوا على أيديهم لو نزلوا قالوا يا جماعة رايحين فين قال حرية شخصية وفين حرية شخصية يا حبيبي <تصفيق> انت عمالك بتفتح حفرة أنا وياك راح نغرق مع بعض فيش فيها تكون عم تزرع مخدرات وبتوزع مخدرات وتقول لي حريه شخصيه وكذا زي ما انت ما هو انا ابني بوقع ببراثن المخدرات بتعاطى مخدرات برجع بيكون مخدر مش شايف بيمسك سكينه بقتلني وبقتل امه كيف يعني ما ما حريه شخصيه ما في حريه شخصيه فهذا قيس عليه فهذا المفهوم بدنا نفهمه انه انا لازم استخدم سلطتي لكون صاحب سلطه لساني كلامي توضيحي لما الامر عماله ما بتحدث عن خصوصيات ولا واحد داخل في بيته قاعد لحاله عم بيعمل شغله غلط مثلا ممكن لا ماثر على حدا ولا حدا بيعرف عنه اصلا الله يستر عليه ويهديه ويرجعه الى الله سبحانه وتعالى
لكن انت لاحظ كيف بقول لك فان نقبوا حفروا هلكوا وهلكوا وانهم امسكوا على ايديهم نجوا ونجوا فنجاة المجتمع لا بد لها من منظومة الأمر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر ديروا بالكم ترى كل أمم الأرض تطبق هذا المفهوم بس ما بيسموه هيك ومعاييرهم بتختلف في ما هو المنكر وما هو المعروف وإلا حتى في الدول حتى في الدول الإلحادية وحتى في الدول اللادينية وحتى في الدول التي لا دين لها يكون في عندهم منظومة قيم مثلا على سبيل المثال الإساءة للأطفال إساءة للأطفال مثلا في دول علمانية لا دينية لو أي واحد في الشارع انتبه لأب أو أم بضرب ابنه بأنبه ببكي مباشرة يقوم بمنظومة الأمر بالمعروف بيتصل دغري بالهيئة المختصة والبوليس وبالشرطة وبيجيبهم وبيجوا بقبضوا عليه وبيأخذوا الولد منه بيحققوا معاه وإذا هو وإلى أخده هذا تمام هاي عم يسوي بس إيش على منطقة هو المجتمع ارتقى إنها هذا منكر عظيم جدا بينما لم يرى شغل آخر إحنا المنكر عندنا في فهمنا ينبع من شريعتنا وأختم المفهوم اللملم كله بإذن الله نكون وضحنا الأقتقاط الأساسية في لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها بس لا تنسى أيضا لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا ما آتاها فإن آتاك الله قدرة لسانا سلطة فهما معرفة ضمن ظلال الآيات الثلاثة الحديث والآيتين كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون تنهون وحديث السفينة ومن رأى منكم منكرا من نعرف الترتيب للرتبة واليد لا تعني يدك أنت تروح تخبط وتربط وتكسر وإنما هو استخدام السلطة إن كنت ذا سلطة أو صاحبة قوة وجب عليك أن تستخدامها في رفع الظلم في تغيير المنكر والله أعلم أسأل الله أن يرحمنا برحمته وأن يفهمنا دينا العظيم أن نكون رسلا للخير والسلام في العالم أجمع حياكم الله نلقاكم على خير بعد حوالي ساعة ونصف في نفس المضامين باللغة الإنجليزية للمهتم حياكم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسوله بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته my dear brothers and sisters in Islam and welcome back to another episode of The Art of Parenting this is your host brother Ali it's an honor for me to go through with this with you may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you your family health and wealth and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the highest level of Firdaus al-A'la with no accountability as it gathers us tonight today I actually was going to talk about something else but on the way over my daughter Sara she told me let's talk about Christmas and I think she's right so the art of parenting is sometimes you have to listen to your children and that's exactly what I'm going to do today so we walk the talk and lead by example and uh, I will honor my daughter's request and let's talk about how they deal with your children in the Christmas time talk about the good the bad and ugly the truth false or friction meaning if I x <laughs> or fiction if I c T-I-O-N. So it talk about what is it exactly and how people feel about it and how do you handle your children when it comes to Christmas time, not just Christmas time, when it comes to Halloween, when it comes to Valentine, when it comes to everything else that comes by living here in the West, especially in Canada or whatever you may be. Alhamdulillah that we have our own belief and we have our own aqidah, we have our own Eid. So we don't have to worry about that whatsoever. It's not us that we have to worry about. It's our children, especially the one that are born and raised here. Now, some of us actually have children who were born and raised somewhere else, and we just migrated recently, so I'm not worried about them too much. But born and raised here is the one that I have a little bit concerned because you don't understand it, especially when they were not raised in a proper manner. And ourselves, we're not really on the straight and narrow either. Let's just be honest about it. Let's be frank, and we gloves are off is our approach. Is whatever it takes to get there and get back on the right track is my motto, inshallah, by making learning fun. Let's talk about the truth behind Christmas. You will know that even Christian scholars will tell you that they don't believe in Christmas, not in the Christmas in itself, as we see, as we know it, but in itself, meaning that 25th of December, because they know it was a pagan holiday. You know, it was they actually used to worship the sun and all of that background that you surf it, you'll find out that that's what it is. So true Christians actually don't celebrate Christmas. But as you know, the secular Christians and the ones that actually don't know the truth about it, they're not so religious, like the average person, like we have it ourselves as Muslims. We have the average secular Muslim. We have the average Joe, the hand-me-down Muslim, the one that doesn't know about Shabbat Islam, but who's born a Muslim. Their mom and dad told them to do so, and that's basically what it is. We found out later that actually according to Quran and Sunnah doesn't mean much what we talked about, and that's what we know. We don't know much about our religion, but we inherited it. 
my name is Muhammad, my name is Fatima, I was born into this deen, but I don't know much about it. And that's more of a cultural Islam. They have the same thing too. By the way, not everything. It's every religion on the face of the earth has the same issues and same concerns. And when I sit on the multi-faith committee, and actually all the religious uh, spiritual leaders, we talk about these issues and we have the same concerns, we have the same issues, but it's just in a different culture, in a different religion, different color, different the language, different country, but it's the same issues. So in your when your children actually look at the beautiful Christmas lights, and I'm and they are beautiful, I'm not gonna deny that fact. As a matter of fact, Sheikh Abdullah Idris Habidullah shared this story with me. He said he was walking once in a mall, and there was a mother being told by her child that these are beautiful Christmas lights. So she said, no, they're not beautiful. They're ugly. So Sheikh Abdullah Idris was right there, Habibullah, and he says, do you know who I am? She says, yes, I know who you are. He says, don't do that to your children. They are beautiful Christmas lights. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to, if we believe that these are Christmas lights, that uh, it doesn't mean, speaking of lights, I'm just getting a flag that my battery is low. So just in case the lights are out, <laughs> it's not like shaitan is trying to get me off track and, and not make me talk about how to handle Christmas. Inshallah, we'll get through it. But just in case I cut off all of a sudden, don't worry about it. There's no jinn here. So Allah kareem, inshallah. So in, in essence, we have to also understand that we live in this country. We have to also be respectful to others. Doesn't necessarily mean we have to believe in it and follow into it and enjoying that what is uh, what we don't believe in. That's not the case. But we lakum dinukum waliyadin to your way to me my way, and that's basically what we are preaching here. However, there are certain things that we have to understand that if somebody actually says Merry Christmas and do we start or don't start? And I like look, I know that there are differences between the scholars. I understand that a lot. But I usually say, you know, if somebody tells me the same thing, I say the same to you. Yeah. And we can use uh, some of the opinions of the scholars. Says, "Assalamu alaikum, wa You know, in hiyatum bithiyah farudu bihsamina auruduha. So, if if you're greeted by a greeting, greet with what's better, or at least reply to it. And I understand it's not assalamu alaikum, and you know, you're going to say assalamu alaikum and tabi al huda. Um, I mean, peace be upon those who uh, follow guidance according to the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Had a mixed company. What do you reply? So he says, "Assalamu alaikum and tabi al huda." May peace be upon those who follow guidance. So we can use that to get out of all the difficulties. And there are differences of opinion among the scholars. There's the hardliners and there are others. But you know, you're living here now, brothers and sisters. We look for solutions. So if somebody tells you this with a smiling face and you're going to go like this and you go, you're, you're kafir, you're going to hellfire and all of that stuff, it's not going to do much very good for Dawah or Islam whatsoever. They don't understand it. Okay. And they do come and say, you know, uh, Ramadan Mubarak to us and all this, and it makes us feel good. Doesn't necessarily mean that we have to reciprocate and say, you know what? Well, Merry Christmas and Happy Halloween and Happy Halloween and and Happy Valentine. It doesn't mean that. Yes, to you, your way, to me, my way. It would be nice. Well, we have to be nice, but in a way that doesn't take us out of our own faith and our own belief, and we have to do so. However, we have to lead by example and also show a, our children how to handle it and why. Okay, so we have to. Explain to them why even some of the Christians don't believe that December 25th is the birth date of Jesus, Isa alayhi salam. And we believe that he is uh, uh, the Ruhullah, he is the spirit of Allah. He is Kalimah Dumin, he is the word of Allah, meaning Kun, Ayakun. He is what it says, be and it is. And he is the one, he was born of immaculate birth, no male intervention. He, he is alive, he is coming back. Shikhala, you are muted. Shikhala. Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, we have uh, some other things that are uh, coming in that we uh, don't understand. It. So we have to do our homework. We have to tell our children, raise them, and teach them what we believe in, Isa alayhi salam. That we don't, you know, we have that much in common. We tell them what, what, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told about Isa alayhi salam in the best way possible. And how the hadith, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi what he talked about. And he was... Good to sit on, on all of the ayat that we can actually train our children to be able to be immune and also to have the ammunition to be able when they go in the battlefield to know exactly how to and how to deal with others when they accuse them that you are this and you are that and so on. So these are the issues that we have to discuss with them. Be frank with our children and be frank with ourselves because if you're going to be like them, you're going to be resurrected with them. 
And that's what Prophet Muhammad said. If you're going to be like acting like other people, you will be resurrected with them. So do you want to ask yourself a question? Do I want to be resurrected with them? You know, yeah, because the hadith says, you know, the, the, the ayah, Allah says to Maryam, السلام, the mother of Jesus, may peace be upon him, Isa, السلام, that shake the trunk of the, the, of the, of the date tree, you know, the, the dates will fall onto thee. So that means it was most likely in the summer. That's what the majority of the scholars will say. Regardless, it's not really our topic now. But since it is what it is, we have to know what we're talking about. Understanding that uh, what what does it really mean, the resurrection, the crucifixion, the, the trinity. It, take that opportunity to, to turn a negative into a positive and make it into a training session and raise awareness and educate your children what it's about. You know, understanding what, it's, uh, what, uh, what they say and why they think that way. And why we have to believe in what we believe and what we actually believe in about Isa alayhi salam. So when I talk to these people about Isa, how we believe in him, they say, we follow Isa more than you. You know, he used to put his forehead down to the ground. And we uh, and all of that, we explain to them that you will find out, wow, you're not that far. And believe it or not, they will not think that you are so different and you're not uh, a terrorist, but you're a tourist. <laughs> in the land of Mingan Hadi and ain't this thing funny, it's all about money. So please understand that you don't have to compensate your religion in order for you to be taken in as a friend, your order to be, be accepted, in order for you to be able to ask your children to go ahead and celebrate with them. You're one of them now. You're Canadian. Yes, we are Canadian. We are proud Canadian indeed. But we are Muslim Canadians. We have our own identity and there's no contradiction and there's no conflict of anything else that we are supposed to be the best of both worlds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you, protect your family, protect your health and wealth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you, keep your identity to be as you are. Your name is Muhammad, your name is Fatima, your name is Aisha, Khadija, Abdul Rahman. Nothing else will change that. And no one else will affect you more than that. Remember, we say Allahu Akbar every time, all the time, in the adhan, in the aqama, in the prayer. First thing you heard in your right ear from your father was Allahu Akbar. So live accordingly. God is greater than what? Than everything. Remember, nothing will change that. So don't change. Don't be a fruit salad. Today you're an orange. Tomorrow you're an apple. After that, you're a banana. Hold on to who you are. And I'm going to quote a line from the Lion King. Remember who you are. May Allah bless you. Family, health, and wealth protect you. Hold on to la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Hold on to your identity. People will respect you for that. You don't have to offend anyone in order for you to hold on to your identity. It is, after all, one race. It is a human race. And it is freedom of religion and freedom of speech. They can't force you to believe in anything else. And they do understand that. It is the mosaic. It's not the melting pot like our neighbors in the south. We are the north. Everybody respects everybody here. So let's keep it that way. May Allah bless you. Jazakumullah khairan for your time. And I will see you, inshallah, next week. Don't forget your dua. I won't forget your dua. Subhanak Allah, muhammadik, tashiru la ilaha ant. In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most compassionate, the most merciful, all praise and thanks are due to him and peace and blessings be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He who is guided by the will of Allah, no one can misguide him. And he who is misguided, no one can guide him except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Respected brothers and sisters, anyone who's watching Muslim Do application, we are honored actually in this new season to have, mashallah, a number of uh, great uh, da'yas, great scholars, great preachers whom they are working really, really hardly on the ground here in Canada and in North America. One of those well-known, renowned, mashallah, uh, brothers, Imam Sheikh Taha Ghayur. Assalamu alaikum, uh, and you are most welcome, brother uh, Imam Taha, to be, uh, uh, you are most welcome to be with us and with our audience. Walaikum assalam wa wa barakatuh. Pleasure is all mine. Jazakum Allah khair. Jazakum Allah khair. I mean, would you mind please in one to two minutes just given uh, our audience an idea about uh, who is Imam Taha Ghayur? <laughs> sure. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Uh, my, uh, uh, Alhamdulillah, I work with a couple of uh, different organizations in different capacities. Um, so I'm associated with Sound Vision, which is an Islamic media and Muslim uh, media organization. We recently launched Muslim Network TV, alhamdulillah, and uh, which uh, basically is a Muslim channel for 
Muslims in North America, as well as um, some of you may be aware of Adam's World uh, children's puppet programming, uh, puppet shows uh, for kids for the past 30 years. So that's Lush, Sound Lush, Vision. Lush. Um, other than that, um, I also work as an executive director for Justice for All Canada, which is a Muslim human rights advocacy organization advocating right. for Muslim minorities around the world that unfortunately do not get a voice. Um, uh, in most cases, those who are especially going through genocide and human rights violations. So Mashallah. that's basically <laughs> it. You know, we can inshallah talk about well, like, You know, Brother Imam Taha, I think the 15 minutes that we managed to take from you, we are so, so precious and valuable. Mashallah. If you have all of this good business, may Allah accept from you and give you the blessing, inshallah. No. I will view with uh, your audience, respected brothers and sisters, Brother Imam Taha today will be highlighting for us the concept of consistency in good actions. Please enjoy this beautiful experience. Hayyakum Allah. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you, uh, Sheikh Amjad, as well as the amazing uh, Muslim Do team. And uh, yes, uh, the topic that I was requested today to uh, to talk about is has to do with the top the idea of consistency. Um, and it's based on beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam. I'm sure many of you have heard this authentic hadith um, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminds us um, about أَحَبُّ الْأَعْمَالِ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى أَدْوَمُهَا وَإِنْ A very uh, beautiful hadith of the Prophet where he, he tells us that the most beloved actions to Allah, to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala are those that are done uh, that are not things that are necessarily huge things that are you know uh, big uh, big splashes or you know things that are shared you know on, on things that you know make a big mark and big splash on social media things that are the in fact the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves are those that are consistent so not one of those not one offs things that are consistent, even if they're little, even if they're small, because it is those small actions that lead to big successes and big actions that we also, of course, want to achieve. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu in another hadith reminds us, and this is recorded in Ibn Majah, iklifu min al-amali ma tutiqun fa inna khair al Amali adwamuhu wa inqal. Same idea, very similar words. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, uh, take up good actions only as much you are able to do for the best deeds are those that are done regularly, even if they're few. Now, th this is important because if you think about it in, you know, in the month of Ramadan, just the beginning of Ramadan, what happens? Everybody wants to, uh, you know, gets really, really excited, wants to have some super big goals. I'm going to you know, finish the Quran probably five times the, the, the month of Ramadan, perhaps, or I'm going to pray all night, or I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And literally 10 days go in, five days into Ramadan, you know, we, we basically sort of, you know, go to the lowest level of de denominator, right? Um, if you look at New Year coming up, a lot of people have New Year resolutions, 70 something percent, 77, 75 percent never go past the first, you know, two weeks. Why is that the case? Well, partly because, not just the only reason, partly because there is no discipline to continue doing those actions consistently. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That Allah, uh, and, and as for those who strive hard in our cause with us or in us or for us, we will certainly guide them to our ways. And Allah is the most, uh, Allah is most surely with those who are muhsineen, the ones who do good. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is the one who is going to guide us and open paths, not just sabil subulana, like, you know, paths open up ways for us if we are consistently working towards the goals, even if in his so-called small capacity. So what do, we, what do we mean by when we say consistency? I mean, according to... The Oxford Dictionary definition, consistency is the quality of achieving a level of performance which gives you, uh, which does not vary in quality uh, over time. 
In simpler words, it's about performing a deed or action regularly with the same quality, passion, and enthusiasm, right? And that's, that's hard. Um, and I wanted to share a few examples of what, 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 are, what are we talking about uh, or what does it take to sometimes achieve big things really at the end of the day, what, what it takes is really that consistency because our deen and our, our Islam is not about running a sprint, right? It's about running a marathon, which requires daily practice. Ask anybody who has ever done, uh, participated in any major sports events, especially marathons, you know, how many years they actually practice until they get to that point, right? So think about that for a moment. Um, but even think about some big achievements done by very simple, ordinary people. Um, and for instance, think about that person, uh, a brother who actually decided to walk to Hajj uh, from Bosnia a few years ago. Uh, what it took for that person to actually get to that point to be able to do it. It was that consistent you know, practice and walk. I think about those people from the UK a few uh, two years ago, I believe, uh, who biked uh, from all the way from the UK to do Hajj and ask, think about their journey, talk to them. And, or if you listen to the interviews, they'll tell you what it took was that consistent, you know, measurable effort on a daily basis, no matter how hard or how easy it was, they had to do it. Um, in fact, as we know, nothing in our community and nothing in, in our careers even is ever built ba uh, overnight. Any movement, any community, any organization, any business, any career is built on small building blocks that are, you know, that people are working towards on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. Um, and, you know, a very good example of, we were just talking about Hajj. I remember a, reading a story, a beautiful story just a few years ago of an, an, an old Indonesian sister who for 23 years collected scraps of money, a little bit of money every single year by doing what? By collecting garbage and cleaning garbage every single day for 23 years to do what? To be able to do Hajj finally, Alhamdulillah, right? So again, there are, these are beautiful examples of very ordinary people who are able to do great things in life because they were able to do things very consistently, Alhamdulillah. Um, and uh, one example that comes to mind, and I love this analogy, is I don't know how many of you ever heard of this example of a Chinese bamboo tree which is a very special tree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Chinese bamboo tree is one of those very unique trees. If you were to um, sow the seed in the ground, it takes five years, up to five years before it begins to sprout. Five years, it requires your hard work. You need to water on a daily basis. You need to make sure the sunlight is there. The, 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 you know, all the ingredients on earth are there. You have to have real iman, you have to have real tawakkul to be able to actually continue uh, and believing in your product, believing in your cause, believing in your uh, end result, believing in your final goal. Five years of commitment. And guess what happens? The moment it starts to sprout, it shoots up 90 feet above the ground within a matter of six weeks. This is what it takes to get the kind of fruit sometimes we need in our life. Sometimes we have our own proverbial, uh, uh, you know, symbolic Chinese bamboo trees in our lives. There are definitely things in our lives that hopefully we are working towards and maybe we can become impatient about. Maybe it's something to do with your ibadah, something in the area of your uh, career, something to do with issues of justice, social justice in our community, something to do with building perhaps a community or building a masjid, something to do with your family goal, something to do with your own health goals, perhaps, right? All of those things are Chinese bamboo trees in our lives that are waiting for you to have real tawakkul with and real patience with for a good five years, subhanAllah. And that's when you start seeing the real fruits and the real results. So what does it take for us to become people of consistency as our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminds us? A few quick things that I want to share, inshallah, before we end. Number one, it requires a real focus. Today, we are dramatically, drastically distracted 
on a regular basis and daily basis by all sorts of things that are, you know, bombarding us on social media, on TV, on, you know, on our lives, everywhere we have issues basically where that we are dealing with. And, uh, and unfortunately, we're losing focus. Number one, that's what it takes. Number two is start small, start segmenting, uh, uh, you know, in your, your big goals into daily, weekly, monthly uh, goals. And, uh, and you know what? Um, subhanallah, if you ask any CEO, if you ask anybody who's successful in this world, you will be surprised. This one common habit you would come across and, and scientists have talked about is that they make small lifestyle changes that are part of their daily and weekly uh, routine. That's basically what it takes. Small lifestyle changes, nothing drastic. 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, 10 minutes of reading Quran or memorizing Quran, 10 minutes of that, reading a book, um, planning your week, whatever it takes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, small lifestyle changes, but it leads to real big results. And that thirdly is it requires consistent routines. Have, all successful people have very specific set morning routines and night routines. Most successful people have set routines on a Sunday night when they plan for the week and so on. And fourth is it requires a, um, you know, for you to block out of your mind and your culture and your environment, any negative news and self-doubts. Okay. Self-doubt is killing us these days, unfortunately. We need to work towards uh, getting rid of and blocking self-doubts in our minds. So, you know, and this is why there's actually a very interesting saying that says that you will never reach your destination if you stop and throw, stop to throw stones at every dog that barks at you on your way, right? Uh, of course, that's something we do not promote. We don't actually throw stones at any, any animal, anybody, but it's a, an idea that Every time something distracts you, you start actually hitting things back or you become, you know, a person who is responsive. You're never going to reach your goals. So block out negative people, toxic people in your lives um, and make sure that you have somebody, some accountability process so people can remind you um, of your goals that you want to achieve, inshallah, so that you can do it consistently on a regular basis. Hold yourself accountable through that mechanism. And um, the second last thing is, of course, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you thabat, to give you consistency and firmness in whatever. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is for brothers and sisters that have been watching me for the last uh, many, many weeks, we've been talking about the da'wah, um, how to articulate the message of Islam with the wider society. Obviously, we want to start with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And we are discussing many, many topics in the last little while from what is da'wah, motivation, and rewards of the da'wah, why knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the prerequisite. Then we covered the fitra, and then at some point we covered the go-rap approach, what is the go-rap approach? Then we covered God's existence. How do we articulate that there is a creator? And then we articulated, how do we know that this creator is one? So, Bismillah, today we'll be discussing the link between the go-rap. And the reason why we're discussing this, brothers and sisters, is that unfortunately in the da'wah, what is the impediment in the da'wah when, when it gets held back is usually... We may be sharing the message of Islam, but subconsciously people have issues that are going on in their head because they're questioning, uh, because we live in you know, in the non-Islamic worldview, so they usually believe they have a worldview of religion through the Christian paradigm, the Christian worldview. And in the Christian worldview, God is all powerful and all loving. And if God is all powerful and all loving, that causes a bit of a challenge for people because they're questioning if God is all powerful and is all loving, why am I going through stuff in my life? Why am I losing my job? Why am I going through family issues? Why am I going through uh, all these crises? So the impediment of, of the Dawah or the challenges with the Dawah is these people, unfortunately, don't have the answers for that. Alhamdulillah, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and and the deen of Islam, these challenges are not for the Muslims because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islamic theology is not just only all powerful and all loving, He's also also all knowing and also all wise. And those questions from all knowing and all wise defeats 
their question just because they don't understand why they what they're going through that doesn't mean there's no wisdom in it so there's definitely a wisdom and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us this wisdom so sometime in the dawah it's not really necessary just talking about god and he's one and god has sent us his revelation and the prophet muhammad the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is to explain to people that there is other hidden things you'll see lots of atheists and lots of people like sam harris and uh, richard dawkins that they talk about you know if god is you know all this perfect god with love and mercy how come this evil and suffering so in in islamic theology we don't have these issues because islam explains to us why there's evil and suffering so uh this is very important to articulate this in islam in the dawa for for the non muslims and sometimes even with the muslims that we there is a reason why we're going through these challenges so today what we want to discuss is you know we will be discussing in the last couple of so we discuss what how do we explain there's a god how do we explain he's one but subconsciously in the non muslims mind is that okay and i believe is one and there's a thing called mesotheism you know you guys could read up about it basically means they believe in god but they hate god why do they hate god because they believe that you know it comes from that egocentrism that they believe that god is equal to them and why is he doing this so by explaining to that god is all powerful you know all loving but he's also all knowledgeable and all wise that defeats their thought process but now there's a challenge there are you know why is this happening to me so for this reason before we can get into explaining the the theology of islam we need to discuss that god has given us reason he has told us to do our emotional needs our our you know existential needs are telling us all these things and in those things they are explained to us so we need to discuss these in the dawa without just throwing islam at people to explain to them uh, uh that they, there is a reason why we're going through these challenges so some of the questions that people are having the big questions about man life and the universe what is the purpose of our existence as a human being why is there suffering in the world and if there is a creator why does this creator let bad things happen uh why are we here what is it for where are we going and is there life after death these are questions that the 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 message of islam the quran the book of allah subhanahu wa taala gives us but before you know we can engage on why the quran is allah subhanahu wa taala we need to sometimes discuss these things uh the big questions of man life and the universe right so as you know we'll just discuss some of these points quickly that we believe that the reason why we here the purpose of life is allah subhanahu wa taala said i created the mankind and the spiritual to worship him and we that is our purpose that's our reso detra our reason of existence and why is there suffering allah subhanahu wa taala tells us why is there suffering for there's many different reasons sometimes something where our own our own hands have done we believe sometimes life is a test sometimes the test is a partial test sometimes the test is for us sometimes like for example you know let's say you know i remember my stepdaughter uh had brain cancer so now i can say that this is a test for her but it's not just a test for her it's a test for me as well that i have to see a child go through pain and suffering or it's a test for the medical uh world to see how they can help that young child so it's not always necessarily a test for the person that's going through it's a test for the people that are going through and you know and islamic discourse explains that you know when you die from let's say you know let's say covid-19 you know for us we believe they're a martyr they go to the janna right uh we believe if you die in you know swimming you you drown in a swimming pool you go to janna uh a bomb drops in your house you know and you didn't do anything wrong you go to janna so we believe there are uh, you know many reasons that allah has given us and we need to explain to them and but we need to keep them in the lenses of worship why because let's say i always give this example in the dawa so in the dawa i always explain imagine there's a tsunami in a certain country so in islamic discourse we have a responsibility to go help those people by burying our loved ones if there's a big calamity let's say there's a tsunami or something right so we go bury our loved ones which is fard kifaya right this is an obligation on the muslim community which is part of worship and then we have to help those people rebuild their homes which is part of worship and giving them sadaqa to rebuild their lives is part of worship so ibada leads janna worship leads to janna so we need to keep that in the lenses 
when we're speaking to, to non-Muslims, and even sometimes in the Muslims, that we're here to worship God. And sometimes going through calamities is still part of worship. As you know, that the prophet, uh, you know, uh, in the Quran that, that was going through lots of tests and trials, uh, you know, and he was patient. And sometimes being patient is, is part of worship as well. So there are many reasons why we're going through these questions. Unfortunately, when we look at other traditions, Allah or they might be resonance or few things here and there, they're from God, but you know, they don't have the holistic answers for man, life, and the universe. So, as in the Dawah, brothers and sisters, we need to articulate this when we about Islam that why are people going through, you know, and what does the, the creator want from us? Why are we here, and why do bad things happen to us, you know, and you know, we're here. As a temporary stage, as you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, you're like a traveler in this world. You come and you rest like under a tree and then you continue going. This is not our final abode. This, you know, is, is for us. I always explain this like a springboard. We're going to be here for a certain time and we're going to our permanent home or our the next life. So everything we do here is based on what we do here will get us into a, a better place in the next life. So we need to give them the right understanding of Islam, what Islam is teaching uh, and give them that that correct uh, you know understanding, and inshallah that will open the hearts. It'll open their their fitra to be able to listen uh, to the to the message of Islam. So obviously Islam tells us where we're going, uh, you know, after life, and we believe there's a life after. All of these questions people are yearning to ask: Why are we here? Right? M you know, man, life, and the universe. So obviously. Even when it comes to our spiritual needs, what, you know, all of us are somewhat spiritual, right? As a human being. Uh, and, you know, you know, what, what does that mean? This creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is Al-Awwal, Al-Akhir, Al-Bar, the source of goodness, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, the merciful, the, the most merciful, Al-Ghafar, Al-Ghafur, you know, the forgiving, the often forgiving, Al-Wadud, the maximally perfect loving being without any deficiency and flaw. And we believe Allah is, you know, his names and attributes is Asma Safat. His names and his attributes are maximally perfect without any deficiency and flaw. For example, you know, Allah is Al Wadud, the maximally perfect loving being without any deficiency and flaw. You know, we love people. Like, for example, my mother would love me because she needs to love me. It completes her as a human being. Allah is Al Ghani independent. He doesn't need to love us, yet He loves us. So we need to explain to them that, you know, our is you know will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us we believe that the creator is his watching and seeing al sami and al basir all seeing all hearing and he knows what's going on and he's guiding he's al hadi he's the guider right and to explain to them that you know he's in control of everything you know he who, who's looking after all the affairs he's watching everything from his irada and his kudra with his will and his power Obviously, we explained in the last couple of times in the two classes before that we believe the creator is not part of the creation. It's out, outside of creation. So we want to make sure that we articulate that the creator does not become creation. So we want to explain that Allah is from his irada and his kudra with his will and his power. He's in control of everything. It's not that he's unaware of what's happening. So we need to have these, you know, these, these conversations. But these conversations come from you know, being thankful, you know, reminding people what is the purpose of life? You know, who gave you this life? Who gave you your eyes? Who gave you your ears? Who gave you your mouth? Who gave you your kidneys? Who gave you a heartbeat? Who who brings down the rain? Who, you know, creates these, these plants that we, you know, nourish ourselves from? All of these things that are around us, brothers and sisters, is signs that would lead us to the creator, right? So he's absolutely, we need to start with, you know, gratitude and being thankful. Even Surah Bakara, I mean, sorry, uh, Surah Fatiha, even the opening, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alhamdulillah, he says, he's giving us revelation and his revelation is what? Alhamdulillah. And what is that? Is hum, is, is praise, is gratitude, is being thankful. So when we're thankful to our creator for everything he's done, Everything starts from that, brothers and sisters, is to starting with being thankful for whatever we have. We can always look at, you know, someone who's doing better than us and always be in, in a negative mood. Oh, this guy drives a better car. He has, he has more children than me. 
so on and so forth. We need to look at people that are not doing much better than us. They're actually suffering. And that would really ground us to say, you know what? Alhamdulillah, at least, you know, I have a life. At least I have, you know, family. At least I have a job. Whatever state you're at, Allah has put you there because that's where you need to be. So we need to have these kind of holistic conversations in the dawah to speak to people as human beings, not as robots, as we explained a couple of uh, classes before. You know, to start with being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, and we need to, you know, be appreciative of what we have. You know, um, these are some of the things that we want to explain to people. Why is there suffering in the world and not just, you know, get them to just give them, yeah, there's a God. Why don't you believe in God? Because they have these existential questions that they're yearning to ask. Um, and Islam, alhamdulillah, gives us these answers uh, in, in, in our tradition. So this is something we wanted to kind of cover today. Uh, and inshallah, when we go into the next part, which is the revelation part, and we will be discussing how we know that this book is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? But before we get to that, these questions between the go rap god oneness revelation and prophethood as we said this is not a rigid structure you can make it your own whether you could talk about the prophet وسلم, you could talk about the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you could talk about god depending on where you're at but we definitely need to have this in the middle of this discussion because the reason why people are rejecting there's a creator as you many people know that lots of people have done many, many surveys and they're saying that the biggest, the fastest growing religion in the world is atheism and it's on the high rise. You know, even sometimes Muslims are affected by this. Unfortunately, some Muslims are affected by this worldview because we're not looking at Islam as holistically. So we need to give them that proper understanding of our tradition, that is, our tradition is very rich. It has answers for your problems. And there is a reason why you're going through pain and suffering is some evil monster that he wants to hurt you it's there is a you know there's a knowledge and a wisdom so we need to give them what those wisdoms are what the knowledge what is the reason why we're going through that and obviously as we move forward inshallah we'll be discussing in the revelation you know you know what does he want from us what does allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us obviously we know from islamic discourse that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to worship him and what is worship in islam Everything, as you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, everything that a believer does is a worship, you know, as long as it's purely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is done in something good. So what I always say to brothers and sisters, that there is no Robin Hoods in Islam. You cannot rob from the rich and give to the poor. We don't have Robin Hoods. In Islam, everything you do has to be purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do I mean? As you know, our Shahada is La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah in this Shahada basically you say it from the tongue you bring it in your heart and then you show it on your limbs so what do we mean by that la ilaha illallah bring it in our heart means that all our actions are purely our internal actions of the heart and the external actions of the limbs are can be only pure for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean if I go to work I'm thankful that Allah is giving me a body so I can use my, my legs and my arms to create halal risk so I can sustain my family and then that risk becomes uh, as worship. As you know, uh, caring about your loved ones. I love my wife or my children because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me this beautiful family. And because Allah gave me this family and loving your, your family and being good to your family is becomes part of worship. You know, so all of these things, we need to keep that in mind that the, the, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu what he did, what he said, what his actions were, what his speech was, how he carried himself. It's all part of our understanding of the deen and applying them in our life. As we know, the Prophet ﷺ is a role model for us. So we need to show our tradition in a very rich and holistic way. We can't just, just throw people at, okay, you don't believe in God. Why don't you believe in God? Which is a good question. But after that, we need to get into these kind of discussions that, that, uh, sometimes had to be had when they're having these subconscious uh, questions about purpose of our life, what happens to us where we die. I mean, you will never know what happens to you die until, you know, you can, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you from, you know, uh, uh, from his, you know, wisdom and his knowledge, you know. Um, so these are some of the things we'll be inshallah covering. 
uh, when it comes to, you know, what happens, you know, we talk about revelation, uh, we'll talk about that, but I wanted to discuss these now because we might just be going into more talk. Quran is uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then obviously we want to explain to them that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to announce mind who he is, what does he want from us? Why are we here? And obviously explaining his nature, we cannot understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that what he told us in from Quran and Sunnah, right? We cannot come up with the names uh, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes without what he has told us. So these are some things we need to kind of discuss. And we want to know how do we connect with this creator, right? How do we have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taught to us through the Quran and the Sunnah, the teaching of the Prophet, ﷺ, how to worship him, making dua, doing dhikr, connecting with him, asking him for help, um, and explaining what is worship. Because anything that that the Prophet ﷺ has taught us, what is worship, is what we believe is worship. Worship is not that I get a guitar and all of a sudden I start singing the name of God and that will become worship. Or worship is not, you know, I I, you know, you know, pain myself, you know, through my arm and I say, well. This is, or, you know, I do drugs and get closer to God. No, worship is whatever the Prophet ﷺ told us. So we just want to discuss some of these things in the da'wah, inshallah, but definitely talk about these, these topics before we even talk about why the Quran is a book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what I wanted to kind of discuss for today. Uh, these things in the da'wah, uh, you know, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide for our needs, food, drink. Uh, you know, aired loved ones, all of these things we need to cover um, and explain to them why they're suffering. And then we will get into why this revelation and prophethood, which will be inshallah, we'll be covering next week. So, Spanakala wa bihamdika, ashadu la ilaha illa anta, astaghfirah wa tawbuka alaik. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And inshallah, I will see you next week. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, hope you are all doing well that's watching in on muslim do today i want to thank everyone that's working really hard in the background for making this happen as well as dr amjit korsha for giving me this wonderful opportunity today we are going to talk about the arab and ottoman contributions that helped shape hyderabad's identity so hyderabad is a um is the capital of southern india's telangana state and it's also known as the city of pearls um, you know, like famous structures like the Charminar or the uh, Makkah Masjid are present um, in this um, city. And it is ranked the best city to live and work in India. But what brought it to that rank? So today we're going to we're going to start by talking a little bit about history. So prior to the Indian independence, the military barracks of the Nizam of Hyderabad were known as Barkas. And because the Nizams were surrounded by hostile kings in the Deccan, he hired Arabs rather, rather than native soldiers to safeguard his family. And the Chosh were transported from Yemen to serve as military soldiers um, for the Nizams in the ancient Hyderabad state. And according to history, um, the seventh Nizam had entire faith um, in these Arabs, particularly when it came to safeguarding Deccan, because they, compre they comprised the majority of the Nizam's personal army and were more, more trusted than locals because they couldn't defect on other powers and they were trustworthy. So according to one theory, the name Barkas is derived from Wadiya Barkas, which is, uh, so, which is a Saudi Arabian colony. Um, during this time, the Arab population grew and dwelling mostly in barracks um, on the edges of the walled guarded city. Um, the area culture, particularly its uh, Arabian influences, um, which later got ingrained um, in the Hyderabadi culture in terms of food, clothing and traditions um, that are also present today and followed by many families present in India. Um, so. One of the places in Hyderabad is the Medina Market, which is still today. Hopefully one day I'll go there shopping. Um, the Nizams of Hyderabad were well known for their generosity. And prior to the discovery of oil in Saudi Arabia, so before the discovery of oil, um, a portion of the income of the Medina Market, which is still present today in Hyderabad, was used to fund the maintenance of the haram. 
And Mir Usman Ali Khan, the seventh Nizam, greatly donated to the spread of knowledge in India. And the Asaf Jaz also made significant contributions to the service of pilgrims traveling to the Muslim holy city of Mecca. So the Rubat, which is about two kilometers from the Grand Mosque, is managed by the Nizam's charitable trusts, uh, like the Awqaf Committee. And the then Nizam Nawab Mir um, Tan Tan. Tahniyat Ali Khan opted to buy land in the 50s. So over 40 lodges of pilgrims traveling from the Nizam's dominion for, for the Hajj, which is the yearly pr- pilgrimage, um, were built and they would go to these lodges. And there were also there was also a school there for the locals. Um, and Rubat is the name given to those lodges, which comes from the Arabic meaning of places to stay. So now the Nizam and the relationship with the Ottoman Empire. So we've all been watching Arturo. And so, you know, we should have an idea of how this works. The Nizams also held strong ties with the Ottoman Empire. And the princesses Nilufar and Durushehwar, who were descendants of Arturo, were married to the sons of Nizam. So Princess Nilufar... Um, so Princess Nilufar Farhat Begum Sahiba was an Ottoman princess known as the Kohi Noor of Hyderabad, like the diamond of Hyderabad. And she married um, Wazam Ja, who was the second son of um, Mir Usman Ali Khan, which is one of the last Nizams that was um, present before it finished. And, um, and she was his first wife. Um, the second, sorry, the second person, so um, Duru Shehwar, um, she, so Duru Shahwar um, Durdana Begum Sahiba, um, she was an Ottoman princess and she was the only daughter of Abdul Majid II, who is the, um, the Ottoman imperial throne's last here, here and also the Ottoman caliphate's last caliph. So it's really like interesting, like one of them married the last Nizam's son and the other one was the daughter of the last um before it finished so really interesting contrast um the last um so during the reign of the last nizam mir usman ali khan who is also known as the nizam of hyderabad because he made such big contributions in the country like for example electricity were introduced roads and railways were built and railway links were created throughout the state during his 37 year reign And in 1965, the Nizam donated 5,000 kilograms of gold to the National Defense Fund in order to assist India in dealing with the violent Chinese attacks during the Indo-Chinese War. And this financial contribution remains the largest to date. Um, Just as the Kingdom of Gulf, Gulf countries supported the... So that was one of um, his contributions. And to end it off, um, just as the kingdom of Gulf countries supported the British and French against the Ottoman Empire, which led to its downfall. Similarly, the Nizam of Hyderabad also supported the British against uh, the other Muslim empire present in India, led by Tipu Sultan, who is called the first Mizal man of India due to his discovery of the Mizal. So next week, we'll talk about him, inshallah, and about his sultanate, the sultanate's legacy. And we'll also talk about the inspirational story of his granddaughter, whose statue is present in Trafalgar Square in London. So Jazakallah Khair from Muslim Do for hosting me tonight. Um, inshallah, go download the app, you know, you know, go put a comment in the app store, help them out. Jazakallah khair. Take care, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most compassionate, the most merciful, all praise and thanks are due to him and peace and blessings be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He who is guided by the will of Allah, no one can misguide him. And he who is misguided, no one can guide him except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I bear witness that there is no God, but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Respected brothers and sisters, anyone who's watching Muslim do application or any kind of social media platform, assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you. This is your brother, Dr. Amjad Qorsha, with a new episode uh, in fixing misconceptions. 
Today's uh, episode will be about the concept of Al-Amru Bil-Ma'ruf wa Nahi Al-Munkar, which could be translated as enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. Now, this concept, uh, for many reasons, we have, unfortunately, some of the Muslims, for many reasons, social, educational, political, you know, reasons, and out of ignorance sometimes, you have the two extremes in misunderstanding the concept of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. We have some people who understood enjoining the good to use their direct physical hand power and doing some harm to the people. And some people, they left the whole idea of that, the reality that Allah is asking us to spread justice and to enjoin the good and the right thing and to forbid the evil and the wrong thing. And simply they used another complete, you know, surrounding system for themselves and say, leave everyone for his own choices. Don't interfere in the business of anyone, regardless of what they are doing, even if they are harming others. So we have the two extremes in the mindset of some Muslims. Our job here is try to fix this misconception about this important concept which is forbidding the evil and enjoining the good now we need to know the following number one we are a people of scripture we believe in revelation we have received as we believe definitely certainly that our religion is completely depending on two basic sources quran and sunnah quran is our holy revealed book literally from God Almighty through the Archangel Gabriel to Prophet Muhammad up to the Day of Judgment literally in full and was completely preserved. The Sunnah is the prophetic traditions, the, his sayings, his actions, his reactions, which was preserved and was transmitted to us in a very unique science that does not exist in other nations. Now, when we want to decide talking about good and evil, what to do and what to do, what is the classification, what is the definition, what is the way, the approach, the graduality, we derive our understanding, our vision from our revelation. We do not leave it for every single individual to do his own understanding or otherwise we will have, you know, we will have different approaches with the number of Muslims themselves. We will have two, built, which is, by the way, this is a human phenomena, not a Muslim phenomena or an Arab phenomena. Now, if, for example, if people in America or in Canada, if they do not have a group of people who decide to discuss after discussing, putting a law and they enforce the law, definitely you will find thousands, if not millions of people who would disagree with the law who would uh, uh, not just disagree, violate the law. So you need to enforce it. So this is human, human common sense phenomena, not just an Islamic. But in Islam, in Islam, we derive the basic concepts from the revelation. So in this revelation, the Quran, God says, You were the best nation, the best community community ever raised for humanity in joining the good and forbidding the evil so the quranic text states clearly that you as muslims as the people who have submitted themselves to the will of the lord and anyone can be a muslim and this is a message for humanity because you can be a muslim by a word you don't need a visa you don't need a bank account. You don't need a recommendation from anyone. You just decide and you become, and that's it. So in Islam, when you say Muslims, you are not talking about Arabs. We are not talking about Pakistani or Somali or no, 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 no. We are talking about anyone who decided to submit himself to the will of his Lord. God Almighty is addressing anyone who decided to submit himself out of respect to the will of his Lord for the final message of God Almighty, which is Islam uh, through the Quran and Sunnah, he says, you, you is applicable on anyone who submitted. You were the best community, the best nation ever raised for humanity. By how? If you are, you will be entitled to this 
you Muslims, in case if you are applying the following, enjoining the good, forbidding the evil. So number one, about the importance of this. Number two, the most famous saying of Prophet Muhammad says, whoever saw an evil, an act of evil, let him change it by his hand. Many people misunderstood the hand into the direct, literal, physical you know, meaning, which means whatever evil he saw, he immediately go and attack by his hand, which is not meant in the hadith. But when you understand the hadith, the context and the understanding of the ulama, you will see how misconception we have about this. Prophet Muhammad said, now, when you see an evil thing, be aware that levels of changing the evil and the bad varies. On the top and the most difficult is changing by power, by authority. Then by tongue, when you say, when you criticize, when you debate, when you explain, if you could not do this and that, you don't have a power, you don't have an authority, then you move to the final one, which... Islam does not tolerate with you if you do not do it, which is just to forbid the evil by your heart, which means to feel that this is wrong. Okay, I can't change it, but I don't feel happy. I feel sorry. I would love if I could have done something, but I couldn't. This feeling is the basic minimum requirement of indication that you are still a Muslim and a believer. So basically, the, the, and the, the true understanding of this hadith Basically, Prophet Muhammad is saying, if you have the power, in our words now, power, authority, which means if you are the boss, the president, if you are the prime minister, if you are the governor, if you are the mayor, if you are the chief officer, if you are a police person, if you are what you have power, if you are a, uh, you know, the, the MP, if you, you know, if you are a congressman, congresswoman, which means you have authority, you have power. In Islam, you must use your power to stop injustice, to stop evil, to stop wrong. If God enabled you with the power, like what we have said, and simply you ignore the power that God gave to you, I did not stop you are a sinful person. So you must change. Now, but if you don't have a power, you are not a politician, you are not a police, you are not a governor, you are not, you are not, you are not, you don't have, okay? Then use your tongue, okay? Object, reject, declare, write, speak, explain, debate, you know, say, say something, especially if you can. What if I can't? I'm living in a, for example, like some Arab countries now, if even you speak about corruption, just a word, you easily, you easily will disappear. They will take you, they will torture you, and they might kill you easily. No one will know what will happen to you. Okay, at least now in your heart. So it's good to understand that we have levels in terms of the reward and difficulty, and you are asked to change, but the power does not mean you say an evil thing, you go by your hand. No, 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 no. You use your tongue. If you are a people of power, you have to use your power to change. It's like it's a common human. It's like exactly exactly in our daily basis. Like when the law tells the policeman, Mr. Policeman or Mr. Governor, you've been given the authority to protect the people from criminals. If you saw a crime about to happen and you did not use your power to protect the weak against the oppressor, you are doing a, a crime. In Islamic terminology, you are a sinful person. This is the concept, okay? Now, and uh, uh, the other uh, concept that we need to know in this mi fixing misconception, Prophet Muhammad uh, said a very important hadith about the social responsibility of a Muslim towards the society. He said, the likeness of the one who's observing and taking care of the teachings of God Almighty and regulations compared with the likeness of the one who does not care and he's breaking the law, he does not care, he's committing all kinds of sins and bad and wrong things. He said, the likeness of this person and that person is like a group of people who decided to take a ship to go, you know, in the sea. So they were a big number. The ship does not uh, able to take all of them on the upper deck. So a part of them, they went to the lower deck, a part of them on the upper deck. So 
uh, while they are uh, you know sailing uh, in the sea those who are in the lower part whenever they wanted some water from the sea they were bothering annoying their brothers on the upper level so out of a good intention with a very nice pure heart they said in in so that we do not bother our brothers in the upper level let's dig a hole in our part the lower deck okay let's dig a hole in our part so that not to bother them then prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said addressing the, those on the top level they said if those group left people inside the ship doing what they want to do which means digging a hole all of them they will sink and they will die but they stopped them everything will be saved so this is like a social responsibility like it's like when you see someone is about to 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 kidnap a child if you do not stop if you do not call 911 if you do not speak if you do not do something your kid will be facing the same your daughter your son you yourself no one not it will this crime will spread if someone who's doing a crime you have human trafficking making lies against the law you know sexual harassment whatever would you see bad evil action you must do your best if you are a people of power use your power if you are just can speak make a phone call write something speak with someone you have to be a positive person this is the idea of forbidding the evil and uh, enjoying the good uh, i hope that we are able now to to let's say to realize that in islam we are asked to be an excellent human being on earth always causing goodness for everyone and always stopping bad wrong evil actions on earth and this is the true islam and this is the true muslims wallahu alam may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to have the better understanding for our great religion and to be always reasons of respecting allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Muslims and non-Muslims. And may Allah let us be big reasons for non-Muslims to know and realize how great God Almighty in the Islamic understanding is. Allahumma ameen. This is your brother Amjad Qursha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Muslim Do Success Stories. In this segment, we're going to be highlighting and spotlighting Muslim figures in the community, mashallah, who've done outstanding, outstanding work. And for today, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Imam Yahya, Imam Yahya Suleiman from the Orangeville community. Mashallah, one of the biggest things that he's done is start up a masjid and being able to cultivate that community. And not only that, being able to reach out and extend those relationships into different contexts. Amazing, amazing experience. So Imam Yahya, pleasure to have you here. And we're really excited to learn all about your story. Jazakumullah khair, Brother Muhammad, the pleasure is mine to be with you, with, with you all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and make this in your good a'mal, all of you, this sadaqa jariah and this good deed in your a'mal, ya Rabbi, inshallah. And um, first of all, my name is Yahya Suleiman. I am the member of the Canadian Council of Imams. And uh, I am the, um, the Imam of the Orangeville Mosque and Shelburne Mosque and Allison Mosque. Not and sure I'm the founder. Of, I am the founder of the three of them. Alhamdulillah. See, so um, forgive me, forgive me, Imam Yahya. Just to start, like, mashallah, not just one, you got two, you have three. So, so as a starting point, it'd be amazing for our viewers. Let's say who who's people who've never known you people who've never heard of orangeville people who've never heard in a nutshell could you tell us the story like how did you arrive in orangeville how did you start with the th not um, just one two but three minutes i'm sure masha is a long thing but tell us please i i, I moved from um, from brampton to um, to shelburne uh, in 2016 uh, and, and um, just like everyone he would love to go to masjid. He he would love to see a masjid in his in his area, and as you know, and every Muslim knows, the world of building a masjid, you know, as the hadith of our beloved Muhammad may peace be upon him, he said, "Man bana lillahi masjidan bana Allahu lahu baitan fil jannah." Whoever build a house a masjid on earth, Allah subhanahu wa taala build a house for him in paradise. 
And this is the biggest reward. And Wallahi, he will surprise. In the first, it wasn't in my mind. Yes, of course, everybody needs the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who, who can live without the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who can live without the hasanat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving to us? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exchange our sayyat to hasanat. Amin, ya rabbal alameen. And I wasn't think that much that there is a big reward behind to make a masjid, right? But there is a big reward behind to collect the community to come together because masjid, it's a place of sujood, right? It's a place of prostration. The house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we bow, we prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we gather together. In the time of the Sahaba, used to be the masjid, they buy and sell in the masjid, they marry from the masjid, they know each other from the masjid, everything. And I felt like really we, we, need, we need something like that. And I said, but masjid is something very big. Like, how can you make a masjid? Like, it's big. You, you build a masjid. And I said with myself and I, and I said, you don't need a masjid and you bring a chandelier with $30,000, $40,000 to put it in it or you make a member with $50,000 or you make this. You don't need all of these things. Everywhere it can be a masjid. You know, any simple place, it can be a house for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I thought about how the Quran revealed and where it revealed Abu Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Quran didn't reveal on Muhammad, Abu Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in, in, in Kaaba. It revealed in Ghar, in a cave, right? In a cave. For Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to go get the Quran and come back, you know? In a cave. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he migrated, he, he, didn't, he didn't hide in a palace or uh, on a palace or anything. He, he went to the Ghar, right? To the cave. I said, so why I don't get this idea from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I don't need a big place and 20 acres to make a masjid and, and to build a big building with trillions of dollars and stuff like that and have all this fancy stuff in the masjid. You know, no, it's just a simple place for Muslims to pray. And from this uh, step, we meet with, with some of the brothers, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and reward all of them. We meet, we sit together and we need an imam. Who's the imam? Who's the imam? How are we going to get? Uh, because this is a problem for every masjid. You need an imam. And one of the things, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, since I did, I am a volunteer imam. Alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. And I never hesitate to serve the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with every way, shape and form. Alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. And we get a place for every Muslim that he's looking to, to build the house of Allah. You don't need to build a big place. You know, you don't need to, big, to build a big place. You can gather together in a small place and start one by one by one by one. Alhamdulillah, with the help of Allah and support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we start like very little people. It was very little people in, 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 in Orangeville. Maybe like 10 families or something or less than this, like five to 10 families, something like that. We used to pray three people in the masjid. Three people, three people in the masjid, you know. We used to pray four or five in Jum'ah. Fadlillah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now you talk about thousand family around us. Alhamdulillah, like almost thousand family around us. Everybody called, I'm moving. I'm moving to this area. Is there is a masjid? Yes, there is a masjid, alhamdulillah. Is there is a Jum'ah? Yes, there is a Jum'ah, alhamdulillah. We pray 300, 400 person in Eid, alhamdulillah. You know, alhamdulillah, and the community is very beautiful community. We all gather together. We stand together. We support each other together, support the house of Allah. There is no time. I said, hey, we need a carpet. And I don't find like 10, 20 person call me. I am taking the carpet. I'm taking the sound system. I'm taking the, the member. I'm taking this. I'm taking this. You don't need, you need to put the step, the footsteps and take Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as an example. The first thing that he, when he moved, migrate from Mecca to Medina, what he, he did, he established the masjid. He established the masjid, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This one motivate me so much and give me a big courage to stand and to do, we in, let's be honest, we in a society here, all the society, there is no Muslims, you know, around you. There is no immigrant around you. But Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, within these five years, Alhamdulillah, there is lots of Muslim community here. And with Fadlillah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the help and support of Allah, we able to put the Muslim community here in the map of the Islam, Alhamdulillah, in Ontario and in whole Canada, Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, Imam. This, this is the first masjid. Should I talk about the others? Then we're not uh, gonna finish. Let's pause for a <laughs> let's pause for a quick second here, MashaAllah. So the masjid number one, alhamdulillah. Let's so for our viewers just to recap, you started small 
And you don't, you don't look for the fancy, uh, what, the $50,000 chandelier or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes when we think too big, oh, it's unattainable. Or if a mountain is too tall to climb, why bother? You don't even take the first step. But Masha, exactly. if you think simple, it doesn't have to be this giant, uh, big palace to have like nice and simple. It's about community. But mashallah, Imam, so... As All in, right, okay, so walk us through this. Okay, so the first one of the one. things quickly before, uh, sorry, Muhammad, to cut you off, uh, Sheikh Muhammad. One of the things Dr. knows is like, whoever fear to climb the high mountains, he will live all his life in, in the holes. Allah, there you go. But the other thing, that's it, like, because if it's, if it's impossible, why bother people just throw in the towel and just say, Khalas, why? why, why why start something? But Masha, you identified a need. This is the other thing, Imam Yahya, that I want the viewers to notice is that you, if you look to your left, you look to your right, nobody is doing anything, then why don't you, you know, the person look, look in the mirror and say that? Like I, one of my favorite phrases I'm going to share with you, Imam Yahya, is if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. Yes. And Masha, you've done that right there and there. So this is the first measure. So walk us through the second one. And then we're going to unpack this a bit more. We want to explain, like, you know, share like the challenges and things. But let's talk about measure number two and then measure number three. Alhamdulillah, it was, uh, was also like funny. Sorry. Uh, I, I, I said with my family, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, my family, my wife, my kids, it's the biggest support for me after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, with their patience. They didn't fear that I'm going to go night or morning. You know, you know, the da'wah, right? It takes all your time. So many problems happen between the imam and the family or the days just for too much da'wah. You're doing too much things. If Allah don't give you a good patient wife and kids and they're understanding your work, what you're doing and, and your passion that what you like to do, it will be a opposite. You know, it will be a problem in your life. You can't do anything. But Alhamdulillah, Allah gives me wife and kids their understanding and they're helping and supporting me, Alhamdulillah, in this, uh, in this good deed for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I said with myself, I said, oh, some between children, by the way, between the mosque, the Masjid of Orangeville and the Masjid of children is um, like 15, 16 minutes maximum. It's not far from each other. But children is growing so much. And I saw lots of Muslims in children. And so many people, they're going from, from children to Orangeville. Orangeville go back and forth. I said, why, why I don't do something like a little step? You know, maybe it will be successful to like Orangeville. Let's get the carriage. Because you know the, the trick, right? They know the trick now how, how to deal with. I search for a place. I search for so many places. I, I consult somebody with me. But I said, please take this place. We will never find again. I said, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have done the map for the masajid. Then Allah wrote, where are we going to make sujood in this area? I don't bother at all with, I never ever stress or panic or anything that to run behind something. I leave it up to Allah. I just try my best and I leave it up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will choose whatever. Anyway, uh, I search, search, search. In the end, I was going to a place that uh, was with me, my wife, and I was going to see a place to lease it. And this place that I went, I couldn't find them. There is no place. Well, I turned back to come back and I found that in the right side, there is a place for rent, for lease. I went there and I found a church. It's a church, actually. It's a church for, for lease. I said, oh, then why I'm not this, this great step that I will never find like this again. I tried with the, with the landlord. I said, oh, this, this, this. She refused it first. She refused. I never gave up. She rejected me like 10 times. She was like, I can't tell you how much she treated me. But I said, when you do something for the sake of Allah, don't worry about people. Don't bother about people. Leave it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I went, I called even the mayor of the city. I called the deputy mayor. I told them, I need this place. Just help me do something. All these things. Believe me. And all of a sudden, I found a call from the lady. She said, you need the place? Okay, come. And she sent for me a contract. Like it's like a society contract. You know, nobody ever, he can sign it. Nobody ever can sign a contract. Any problem, it will be yours. Any... Any musibah, it will be yours. Alhamdulillah, Allah give me and I sign it. And Alhamdulillah, after I signed this place, the lady came to me and said, oh, we're selling the place. You have to leave. After, after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us. I, I, I just make dua for Allah. I said, Ya Rabbi, I pray for Allah. Ya Rabbi, it's your place. You take care of it. It's not my, any, my part. I did it. This is your part, Ya Rabbi. Wallahi, a Muslim brother, he bought the blazer. Alhamdulillah. And he said, take the place forever. 
I don't need it. Wow. This the Subhanallah, yeah, Subhanallah. This is the Shilbran Masjid, and Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I was shocked from the first Jum'ah that we did in in Shilbran Masjid. Masjid was full, like over, like you talk about 50, 60 person for the first Jum'ah to come. I couldn't believe this. You know, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. We gave, uh, by the way, the, the Orangeville Mosque, over 20%, 22% get, get Shahada for Orangeville Mosque. And uh, yeah, and Shilbran Mosque, the first month that we opened, two people, Alhamdulillah, from, they're originally Canadians. They get Shahada, Alhamdulillah. And one of them, uh, one of them, inshallah, he's marrying an Egyptian sister uh, this, com this month, this coming month. Oh, this month. Alhamdulillah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Allah, Imam. So, Alhamdulillah. This is the so second one. So the second one, let's pause for a second here because it seems to me that Sapala, by putting your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think it, you know the hadith better than I about tying your camel and then putting um, yes. faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no, you've done your part, signed on the dotted line, even though it doesn't didn't add up, it didn't make sense, some things you were saying, but you had this feeling and you just pushed through and subhanAllah so how everything worked out in your favor. So mm -hmm. putting faith even when you can't see it. So now let's talk about the third one. What happened there? The, the third one was people come to from Alistin to pray in 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 Shelburne Masjid. Some of them pray pray in in, uh, in Orangeville. Some of them pray in Shelburne Masjid. For all what I know, it was a place in 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 Alistin. They pray in. It's it's a basement, right? One of the brothers' the basement, but it's not there anymore. The people call there. It's in, in the internet, but nobody there, right? Anyway, one of the brothers also, he's in a, in a farm and very far from the city. Like my main goal to make da'wah more than the Muslims even to come to pray together, 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 together and stuff like that. To make da'wah for the non-Muslims too, because this is our, this, this is a, the, the right upon us to let them know about the deen. This is the Islam. Islam is a peace. Islam is a, is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a blessings from Allah. As Rasulullah sallallahu used to say, Alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-Islam wa kafa biha ni'mah. Enough for the ni'mah of Islam. All praises to Allah for the ni'mah of Islam, and the blessings of Islam, and enough. This is a blessing from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to us. And Alhamdulillah, uh, one of the brothers said, "Sheikh, why you not make a masjid for us? You did Orangeville, you did Shelburne. Why you not do for us in Alistair? Just try your best." I said, "It's it's too much, Lord, and me. Like, how I'm gonna do it?" He said, "Like you did this, do this, and leave it on Allah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala." I told him, "Wallahi, go now." Wallahi, it was Juma, it was Friday. I told him, "Go." And find search in your area because I'm not familiar. If you find a place, just call me and there will be. Wallahi, he went right away. He called me, Sheikh. I found the place. I said, I'm coming to you. I went for him Saturday. It was Friday. I went for him Saturday and I signed the lease for the place. Alhamdulillah. And we get even place bigger than Shelburne one. It's a good, beautiful place. Alhamdulillah. And now people bring Jum'a, bring everything. I did train two people from my community, Alhamdulillah, to make a khutbah and and to lead the prayers and stuff like that. There, alhamdulillah, we're three of us doing it now, alhamdulillah, working as much as we can. Mashallah. And we're planning for the fourth one, inshallah, soon, very soon. SubhanAllah, Imam Yahya. So, there, so it's one pattern I'm noticing is that the first one seemed to be the most difficult. And then second, yeah. and as you get going, once you understand the process, it gets easier and easier, mashallah. Yes. Yes. So let's take a moment here. Let's pause for like... Well, you do it for the sake of Allah. All for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all your tremendous efforts. Now, yeah. I'm sure there are so many things behind the scenes. What, we, yeah. what, you just, what you just shared with us right now is the results. It's the tip of the iceberg. You, but there's so many things that I'm sure went on uh, to make this become a reality. Could you kindly outline some, some of the biggest challenges that you had to face? For instance... One of, yeah. one of the biggest challenges, sorry to cut you off, I yeah. was thinking about who gonna come pray in the place? There is no people to pray. And after that, I said, Wallahi, if I teach one, Alhamdulillah, we have two classes now, Quran and Islamic studies classes. And Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we, we got the award from the city, from the mayor of the city, from the deputy mayor, that we are very, very active community, Alhamdulillah, and help for all communities. And our masjid win the big award in the city, Alhamdulillah, upon all the places of worship, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, in, in Orangeville in Dufferin County. Alhamdulillah. And one of the challenges is this, that, that I said, this, the place is small. We need to get a bigger place, you know? And after that, I said, no problem. Just, it's okay. Let's be patient a bit. And Alhamdulillah, we used to bring 
in a little place like a garage. After that, we extend. After that whole building was, it's ours right now for the masjid. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. The challenge that facing me in, in the first was, I am a human and I have responsibilities behind me. And I am not like a, um, like an imam with salary and I am a voluntary imam. I know I did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I have lots of responsibilities in my neck toward my family and my people and, and everyone around you. This is why I told you, alhamdulillah, that I have a wife and a family there in supporting and understand for what I'm doing. They know this is, they know this, what gonna leave for us, not what we're earning or not what we're doing. All what we're earning are gonna go does nothing. No one ever in this life, he get anything. Everybody went naked. We came naked and we live naked. This all what, what uh, the challenge of it, that we're dreaming, inshallah, inshallah, Rab, to have a good masjid, like what we, uh, we're planning, inshallah, inshallah, we will, we will have it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still, he assigned somebody to help and support, inshallah, for this purpose, inshallah. Subhanallah. So, so let's see if I can summarize at least some of the challenges that you faced. Well, one, one, it's not really a challenge, but it's fortunate that, you know, you have to have a supportive family. If someone is about to embark upon an endeavor like this in whatever community that they're in, if there's going to be internal problems in the, in the house, it's going to, it's like, you're going two steps forward, three steps back, you're pushing and they're pulling and it, yeah. It's like it's you need to be all in at the, at it's, otherwise it's going to be a challenge. This is one thing. The Indeed. second thing is um, mentioning what if people are going to show up? Uh, maybe it's not really in demand, so to speak. Like you know, if you build, you go through all the effort. The third thing was it sounds like legalities, right? The legal paperwork and responsibilities yeah. of that, um, and finding the right place. Uh, do you have any? Do you have any? Let's just say someone who's watching this right now is looking maybe get get got inspired and saying hey let's i'm in the area i don't see any masjid nearby let me start something like we'll, we'll leave maybe that to the end but i wanted to ask uh before that like you mentioned you won mashallah an award with the with your with your the mirror as a community yeah, yeah. mashallah uh, and i i really want to highlight and stress this part because Maybe there's a misconception or at least there's a perception out there. We can't control what people perceive. However, there may be this idea, this illustration that Muslims are only in it for Muslims. You know, you only build a masjid just to serve the Muslims and every other, you know, faith-based culture, whatever. It's just, it's like we're in our own little world in a silo and we just operate within the Muslim community. But no, you reached out and you extended. Can you talk to me a bit more about that? Like what? What was that like process of building relationships with folks from different faiths? And can you give us examples? As you know, one of the one of the pillars of the pillars of da'wah, that the relationship. You have to you have to open a door with the non-Muslims somehow. And because all of us, as I mentioned so many before, we are our brothers and sisters in faith or equal in humanity. We are from Adam and Eve. We all belong, belong to Adam and Eve. As I mentioned so many times this, there is no difference between us as a Muslims and any other community. We love each one. We love everyone. We love all of them. We're Muslims. We love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to make light for the darkness of the other people to bring them to our light, to bring them to the Islam, to bring them to the da'wah, to bring them to the deen, to not Tell them the Muslims is closed mind, the Muslims is doing this, they're strict, it's a strict deen, religion is it's very hard. They marry four wives, all what they know. They marry four wives, they they yeah, wallahi, this is subhanallah. They don't eat the pork, they don't drink alcohol, they don't to go ask a Muslim why you don't drink alcohol, he said, because it's toxicate me, it's making this. Why akhi, you don't make symbol? And he said, Allah told me it's a haram. Don't drink it. Why you don't eat pork? I saw pork, eat garbage, and this, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. Why you don't say, Allah told me, don't eat it? It's haram. You have to be a very good person, practice Islam, and do not involve in our celebrations, and don't go, I'm sorry to say, like, go, like, celebrate Christmas with the, with the Christians, celebrate Diwali with the Sikh, uh, celebrate this with Hindus, celebrate this with this. This is, we need to tell them, this is haram. We're not, we don't hate you. We love you, but we can't go against our aqidah. 
We can't go against our Islam. We can't go against our religion. This one of the things that we focus and concentrate in. We did in Ramadan, alhamdulillah, in the month of Ramadan, one of the tricks for our da'wah, we did iftar. We did free iftar to everyone. In the street, we bought the tables in the street. We brought like 2,000 meals. We keep distribute every day in Ramadan, every day in children, mosque in Orangeville Mosque to distribute iftar for the non-Muslims. We know there is too much non-Muslims going to come. We know there is no much Muslims for this too much meals, right? While we're giving the iftar, we're making da'wah. We're telling them we're Muslims. We are here between you. We're around you. We're giving the da'wah flyers. We're giving Quran and people accepting. They, 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 they like it. They amazed. They said, we never have something like this in our life. Is this free? Yeah, it's free. Even the book, the Quran they take, is this free? Yes, it's free. You know, which means they want. They're thirsty for da'wah. They're thirsty for somebody open the door and knock their door and say, hey, we're here. We're Muslims. We're around you. We love you. We need to get your hand somehow with us. And so many people, we did lots of uh, conversations and dialogues with the church. We did with, with the Sikh community. We did with everyone. But everything with respect and love and care. Because don't talk to me too much about Islam, but show me the Islam in your actions. Show me the Islam in your practicing. You need to practice Islam properly, like the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you, if you tell me about the Sunnah of Rasulullah, and you don't know one hadith for Rasulullah, you don't know how Rasulullah used to eat, you don't know how Rasulullah used to talk, you don't know how Rasulullah used to sit, you don't know how Rasulullah used to sleep, you don't know how Rasulullah used to deal with non-Muslims. When a guy came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he's one of the rabbi of the Yahud, everybody knows this story. And he came to Rasulullah and said, Ya Muhammad, oh Muhammad, give me my right with you. He have, he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took some things from him, like money or something, and he said, give me my money, Ya Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, and, and he, Rasulullah smiled. He told him, it's not, the payment is not due yet. It's not the time for the payment to take it. And Umar radiallahu anhu arda was very angry and he got up and he scared the guy. He, he, he just get mad at the guy. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Umar, we wasn't expected from you this, me or him. Go and give him his right and give him 20 gallon upon his right, uh, above his right for what you have done with him. And this is Rasulullah sallallahu which means Rasulullah used to, to, to deal with the Jewish people, with the non-Muslims, with the idol worshippers, with everyone. Rasulullah didn't close him, himself and said, I'm only making da'wah for Muslims. Only I meet my Sahaba. No, he used to meet everyone. He used to talk with everyone. And this is what the akhlaq of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is what the manners of Muhammad. We learn and we need to give it to this area. This wow. is basically how we're trying to, and we collaborate with Ayira too, to make da'wah here, alhamdulillah. So, Paula, so it, sound, so it sounds like, you know, it's, you know, don't just tell me, show me, right? So you put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. So you go out, you engage with the community, you have a common denominator. Uh, like one example, you mentioned hunger. It doesn't matter what religion you're, yes. everyone understands what it's like when you have an empty stomach. And using this as an opportunity not to force, not to push, just simply showcasing and sharing what Islam has to offer. And, you know, you take it or leave it, that sort of approach and building those bridges and having dialogue. Uh, mashallah, it's, this, this is, is go. this uh, brother Muhammad, a small message, a small message to to all Muslims around us, to all people. Islam is not by accent. Islam is not by spelling. Islam is not by language. Islam is by action, by action that you do that. You do action for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your heart, with fully heart, yaqeen. You have yaqeen in your heart, certainty in your heart that. You're doing right for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And go ahead. It's not by, 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 by talking. It's by action. This is what we need to do. MashaAllah. So, Imam, as much as we'd like to continue this conversation, unpack a lot of the success that you've had, MashaAllah, with building not one, not two, but three, Masajid, Mi'al, Smanta, Put Prosperity, and Barakah, mm -hmm. and all of your efforts, if there was one last piece of golden advice that you would give, let's just say there's someone who's watching this right now, and let's say God inspired saying, hey, you know, I'm looking around. I'm in a similar situation. I don't see any masjids nearby. I would like to try and build something for my akhirah. What advice would you give? Um, I will say two things. The first thing that let's stop to look at others, what they're doing in their life. And we focus on ourselves to enter Jannah. 
this is the important part that we need to do. First, to focus on our a'mal, our deeds, and fix our house. Fix ourselves. Because in Allah, la yughayiru ma biqawmin, hatta yughayiru ma bi'anfusim. Allah will never ever change a nation or a ummah or a city or a country unless they change themselves first. Then we need to start to change themselves, ourselves as a Muslimin, muahideen billah, and focus to go to Jannah. The, the other thing that اعقلها وتوكل do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never give up Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always give you ولا تقنطوا من رحمة الله never ever give up from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yes Sheikh no subhanallah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah and with that it's almost like do your best and leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with that Jazakallah khair Imam Yahya for taking the time out of your day to share your story um, mashallah, it's very inspirational that you, you, you know, if opportunity doesn't knock, you build a door and you've built not one door, you build three doors. And may Allah mm-hmm. allow you to use this in the hereafter and all the wonderful community work that you've done, building relationships and overall goodness. Mm-hmm. And uh, with that, again, thank you for tuning in. This is Muslim Do. Tune in next week for more success stories barakallahu feekum jazakumullahu khairan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaykum assalam